Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord. Be seated. It's a good day to be in the house of the Lord. It's a great day to be in the house of the Lord. You know, I was thinking, uh, when God created us, we were created to worship. But a lot of times, we think we were created to worry. We were created to praise. Not to pack. We are vessels that God, I know we, we look at ourselves sometimes and we think, God, what, what were you thinking when you made me? Anybody, anybody laugh at themselves? You ever just do something and, and you, you just, you, you crack yourself up because of, I don't know what use word you want to insert. Somebody be offended at how silly we are. Yeah. All right. What was God thinking when He thought of me and said, "That is what I want to make." Not in a million years, if I was God, would I look at this body, this attitude, this personality, and be like, "That's what I want to make." I wouldn't even make me. Is that too real? You, you don't feel that way sometimes about yourself? <laughs> well, you just look at yourself and tell you, if I was God, I wouldn't, I wouldn't waste a second on this, this, this person. But God looks at us, and for an understanding that surpasses ours, sees something in us that He loves and will pursue. And we, we sing that song that, that he will knock down walls and he will, he will climb mountains and his reckless love will find us. What is it about us that he's willing to see beauty when, when we see ugliness? We were created to worship him, not worry. We were created to praise him. Not panic. Right, right. Our God's in control. My wife said today's been stressful. I think I could say that probably for the last two weeks. Every day's been stressful. Everything. And all I find myself doing a lot of times is worrying. And I felt the Lord rebuke me and say, if you will worship more than you worry, what if you would praise me as much as you panic? What if you worship instead of how much you worry? And I began to say, oh Lord, you got this. Lord, you're in control of this. Lord, you go before me and make a way. Lord, I can't do this. This is your power. This is by your hand. This is by your strength. This is by your mind. People are more like, we were created to worship and not to worry. We have several prayer requests tonight. Well, I'm going to do announcements first. Then we'll do prayer requests. We have able support meeting. That will be tomorrow night at 6.30 p.m. I would encourage anybody that can make that to come and uh, experience, maybe share a little bit, get to know some people of the community, some of the people that are coming that have not yet been in service with us. Uh, greet them, make a friend, make a bond, unite with them. They many times going through very similar things that we go through. So the able support meeting is tomorrow night at 6.30. Then Friday night, young people, you group, Isaac, you listen up. I don't mean you, Isaac, you, you're Isaac. But I do mean you too, you're part of that. So Isaac is part of Isaac. <coughs> There's a youth rally uh, this Friday night at 7.30 p.m. This is going to be a CAC. The UPCI General Conference is coming up. It's at the Indiana Convention Center uh, in Indianapolis. That's going to be September 24th to 27th. That's actually close enough for many people to drive. If you want to go and be a part of that. I know society is changing. We can sit at home and stream it, right? We can watch it live. And, and so we don't have to go, but there is there is something about being there. 
be a part of it, and can be a part of the worship, be a part of the praise that goes on. Feel the anointing in the house. I know anointing can come across TV. I, I've listened to people when they're preaching and watch the live stream and, and felt the power of God, but it's close enough to go and be a part of it. If you have the time, I encourage you to go. TCG Activity King Car Butt Butt Golf. It's going to be Saturday, September 28th. Meeting at More Life Tabernacle it's at 12 p.m. The ice cream. There will be ice cream following at Cops and Roberts, which I heard is wonderful. Boy, said amen. That's the end of the announcements for today. If you'd all stand, we're going to go for the Lord's prayer request. And the ushers will come and receive tonight's offering. We need to remember Brother Anthony Crenshaw tonight. He's in need of a healing touch. We need to remember Sister Kelly Turner. She's in need of healing. She's not feeling very well. We need to remember Dawn Foster. She's got cancer. Pray that God will heal her. We need to remember David Nottingham. He's in need of special need and salvation. Lift him up. We need to remember Tammy Lambeth. He's also in need of salvation and a special need. This is Sister Dorothy's niece. She's in a desperate need. Also, Sister Sue Waller texted me. She needs healing touch today as well. Um, the list here says Sister Patty Bowie. Let's remember her. Brother and Sister Wilbanks. Brother Donnie Compton. Sister Hernandez. Sister Stinson. Brother Gary Candidate. Brother Bill Walker. Brother Paul Burnett. Sister Juliana Reyes. Brother Larry Starnes. We need to remember the Church of Key West. The Church is in Chile. The churches in Argentina, the churches in Spain, and my request to Sister Rachel Granger, which is not on the list, she said, we need to add Japan to the list. I said, all right, so let's remember Japan as well. And are there any other needs tonight by an upraised hand before the Lord? And let's lift our voices together in one accord and pray for these needs. The Lord knows. God, we thank you, Lord, for all that you've done today. We thank you for what you've been doing in our lives. We thank you, Lord, for the promises that you've been giving people. Lord, we thank you for the answered prayers that have happened. And God, we come before you once more and we pray and ask in the name of Jesus that your healing touch would go to those that are sick in their body. Lord, heal them with 100% recovery. Lord, if they've got cancer, we rebuke the cancer in the name of Jesus. And we pray a healing touch, a healing miracle, God, that only you are able to do, Lord. God, you know the situations by every upraised hands. You know the prayers of your people. God, we pray that you would come by. You would provide for those that are in need. Lord, you would deliver those that are in need of rescuing God. Lord, you are able, God. Lord, you are able. Lord, we won't worry, God. We're putting it in your hands, and we will worship you, God. Lord, we're not going to panic, Lord, but we're going to praise instead. We're going to praise in faith. We're going to worship in faith. We're going to walk in faith, God. So you're doing it, Lord. You feel that way? Can we give the Lord a hand, God? Lord, you're doing it. Lord, you're making a way. Lord, Lord, this time we're going to receive the offering of the Franks, if you would say prayer over it. Amen. Would you bring your offering in worship tonight?
God is great. Amen. Amen. I'm so glad that I know Him. Amen. I'm turning to Isaiah, the 53rd chapter. And uh, Isaiah 53. I'm going to begin reading verse 2. And I will primarily be in the book of Isaiah. Praise God. For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of dry ground. Out of the dry ground, he hath no form, nor commonness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, man of sorrows, and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God. But he was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquity. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Will you pray? Amen. And you may be seated. Praise God. Sister Ayers is requesting prayer for her niece who's headed to the Middle East. So remember to pray for her. Praise God. The major prophets, Isaiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, and Jeremiah, and you have the minor, Hosea, Nahum, Habakkuk, on and on. They are all dealing with a backslidden, idol-worshiping people, both Judah and Israel. Isaiah, if you study out the major prophets, some were called to prophesy to Israel, some were called to prophesy to Judah. Amen. The detail of the judgments of God that were coming in the prophets are sometimes is very explicit. He paints their picture. Amen. On a canvas of horror. Literally of the things that are to come. But of all the prophets, Isaiah speaks not only in the area of judgment, but he more than the others, the others refer. But Isaiah more than the others paints a picture of the coming Messiah. He paints a picture of this Son of God, this fruit of Jesse. He tells how that he will rule and how he will reign. But more than that, Isaiah is profound in painting to us a picture of Emmanuel, which is God with us, in all the capacities and all the offices that he will have to hold to meet our needs. I really want you to get a hold of this thought. Isaiah more than the rest, the others do, but Isaiah so distinctly paints what the Messiah will mean to us. You say us, the church, those that are going to be born again. Amen. When you see the others prophesy judgment, Isaiah is saying he's going to suffer. He's going to go through the horror of crucifixion. He doesn't use the word crucifixion, but he uses a picture painted verbally of an abused man who would be our Messiah. But more than any other, and I really want 
time to drive this home. He paints a picture of what Jesus will need to be for us. I felt as I was praying about this service, the Lord deal with me heavily. But sometimes we need to stop and realize all that Jesus is and all that he has come to accomplish in our life. The picture is a horrible picture, bruised, beat. But the Bible is so profound that Isaiah says, but you don't understand. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquity. The chastisement was upon him. Now you and I both know that the Lord, amen, did no sin, had no sin, but took my sin. But I really want you to grab a hold of this point that he didn't just suffer for no reason. He suffered for us. Hallelujah. I thought his pastor was talking about uh, praise and worship and about worry. Amen. And I was amazed to understand that our God knew all that we were going to go through before we ever went through it and prepared the Messiah to take the office. And you understand what I'm saying? Take the office more in a while. Take the office of the sacrifice, the despised one, the wounded one. I don't believe, and I believe with all my heart, that the church today discounts Calvary. I don't think haven't you heard me. The church discounts Calvary. The Lord bought more for you than you experienced. The Lord bought more for you. Amen. You know, I've been in intense spiritual battle in the last while. And uh, I had to be reminded of the Lord. I had to be reminded by the Lord. If God is for you, who can be against you? Hallelujah. That it's not my victory. He's already accomplished my victory on Calvary. I can claim it for my own. Hallelujah. If death couldn't hold him, then death isn't going to hold us. If the grave couldn't keep him, then the grave's not going to keep us. I think it's time we begin, begin to look up for our redemption draw back. You say, well, God won't forgive me. He won't uh, this and he won't that. Do you think he went through all that he went through just so you could say, hey, you know, I'm so bad, I'm so this, I'm so that. The battle's too great, the trial's too hard, the darkness of the night is too dark, the valley's too low, amen. But I'm here to tell you, he's a lily of the valley, and he's a bright and morning star, and he brought more for you than you are experiencing. Hallelujah. Isn't it a shame? I want to, amen, I'm going to refer to this scripture. I'm going to put my glasses on so I can read it from He was despised and rejected of men. A man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, and as we hid, as it were, our faces from him, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. I'd like everybody to say, He's borne our griefs. Say, He's carried our sorrows. Then why are you picking them up again? Somebody needs to get a hold of what I'm saying. He bore. He did it. It's already done. It's not by your strength. It's not by your might. It's by what he's done. He fulfilled the office of Emmanuel, God with us. He fulfilled the office of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the 
children of the world. He fulfilled the office of one that would take my grief, my sorrow. Oh, hallelujah. I think somebody needs to rejoice a little bit in the God of our celebration when you don't know what I'm going through. You're right, but he does. Amen. Praise God. I'm not going to take time to read all this chapter, but I'm going to tell you he was wounded for our transgression. Somebody say he already paid the penalty for my transgression. He was bruised for our iniquity. You know what that says to me? When we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us. That if you, after you have repented, after you have confessed, amen, to the Lord, and you still carry the guilt of your sin, and you still carry, amen, the burden of your failure, you're not having the confidence in him that you need to have because he bought more for you at Calvary than what you're experiencing. Somebody say thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Amen. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened out his mouth. Oh, God, teach us that secret. I think I've prayed more in the last few years. Lord, help me to keep my mouth shut. Praise God. The confession of our salvation is made through our mouth, but we go too far with it. Amen. He was oppressed. He was afflicted. Yet he opened out his mouth. He was brought as a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before his shearers is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. He was taken from prison, from judgment. Who shall declare his generation? For he was cut out out of the land of the living. For the grand transgression of my people was he stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked, with the rich in his death, because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He had put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hands. I want to tell you, I really want you to hear me. We need to quit this counting Calvary. When you refuse to accept the forgiveness of the Lord, then you discount the blood. I'm going to preach to you straight and hard. When you honestly repent of your sin, you must no longer carry the guilt. Some people say, well, I have trouble forgiving myself. Well, i got news for you. It's not about you forgiving yourself. It's about He who laid down His life. Amen. More than any other prophet, the Isaiah spoke profoundly of what the Messiah would do. I think we need to take a review of what Isaiah said and say, Lord, You did this for me. You, you went through that for me. Oh, hallelujah. Uh, the book of Isaiah. When you go home, read again the 53rd chapter. Read the 11th chapter. One of my favorite is the 9th chapter. Dealing at verse 6. I had preached from that scripture. I had dwelt on it, studied on it. But one day, years ago, the Lord opened my understanding. Amen. That there was more to it that we need to understand. It was describing every office that the Lord had to fulfill for us. You know, you're in a fire. The house is burning. You're coughing on smoke. And somebody comes and says, hey, let me lead you out. Let me lead you out. Are you stupid enough to say, oh, no, I'd rather burn? Thank you. 
No, I'd rather cough a little more. <laughs> hey, don't deprive me. If I want to choke, I'll choke. Yeah. Everybody that thinks that sounds, sounds foolish, say amen. amen. That's what we do when we refuse to accept what the Lord has done for us. I've learned something, you know, over the years, and I've been around a while. I have often had to do marriage counseling. And one thing that I profoundly try to drive home when I speak to that husband and that wife, guilt is not a good motivator. <coughs> what do you say? Most people who come for marriage counseling come to deliver all the guilt of the, their companion. Well, you don't know what he does. You don't know. Where the guilt comes. You know what? Every one of those that wouldn't listen to the word of God, their marriage never, never achieved what God wanted it to. Because guilt is not a good motivator. Amen. If my wife wanted to find fault with me, Boy, would she have a large quantity of things to bring to me. <laughs> but you know what? Guilt is not a good motivator. Right. I'd like to, everybody that agrees with me that, right. with that, guilt is not a good motivator. Yeah. Everybody say it won't help a marriage. Oh, no. Say it won't help, help a relationship. Oh, it won't help a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ either. Because guilt isn't a good motivator. But liberty from sin, redemption from sin, revival, the power of the blood, the power of God in your life. Brother, that's a motivator that will take you all the way to glory. Hallelujah. I'm serious. I think every one of us need to go home do it on the pew tonight if you can do it and pay attention to me at the same time. Every one of you need to go home and say, do I need to adjust my thinking? Did Calvary buy more for me than what I'm experiencing? Is all this heaviness from the Lord, all this that I'm going through, is it from the Lord or did He buy more? for me. I love, and I have mentioned it, Isaiah 9 and 6, but as I said, and many of you have heard me talk about it before, when he described the Messiah, when he gave him titles, I never realized, I became overwhelmed when the Lord revealed it to me. Amen. That everything wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, were offices that God had to fulfill to be my Savior. Amen. If you will dig a little deeper in the Hebrew, when Isaiah says he's wonderful, he's not saying, oh, everybody looks at that and says, yeah, he can heal the sick. He can raise the dead. He can calm the waters. He can do all these things. That is incorrect. That wonderful, if you will study the Hebrew, is a report of his character. Yeah. It's saying he's wonderful. Amen. Amen. It's like I would go to my son-in-law and I can brag on what he can do. I, he can build stuff. He can lay tile. You know he doesn't have much to do, so if any of you need help, <laughs> I just lied. <laughs> He's got more than he can take care of. But I'm telling you, he can. He's a good dad. He's a good, a good husband. Man. When I say wonderful in the context that most people think, it's you're saying what he does is wonderful. 
What the scripture in the Hebrew is saying, not what he does is wonderful, he's wonderful. He is tempted, oh my Lord, I feel the Holy Ghost. He, would, he is tempted at all points, such as we get without sin. There's not one flaw in his character. Do you realize, I've talked about this before, and all of you need to pray about it, because every one of us has got a big mouth. And everybody that would lift their hand and deny that they have it, right there, you're lying. We all, why the scripture is so profound that if a man can control his tongue, he's greater than an army officer that can throw straight truth. But not one word wrong ever came out of his mouth. Because his character, his heart would not allow it because he's wonderful. He had no sin. Amen. Do you think that God is uh, missing in penmanship when God is referred to as love? He loved the unlovable. That was more important than anybody that was sick that he healed. That's wonderful things that he does. But I'm telling you, he's wonderful. Oh, come on. Somebody wave your hand and say, God, I know him. He's wonderful. There's nobody like him. Oh, come on. Somebody say hallelujah. Hallelujah. And I'm going to quickly go over these. I know I don't have a lot of time, but uh, wonderful. He's counselor. You've got to dig a little deeper to have a greater understanding of counsel. It has been often mistranscribed, misthought. They say, well, he's a counselor, you know, like uh, if I got a situation and I go counsel with a pastor. That is a concept of most people thinking that he's a counselor, but that's not true in the Hebrew. A counselor, better defined is, he's my defense attorney. That's right. I want you to know the accuser or the brother is before the throne continually, saying, hey, he did this, he did that, he lost his temper. He committed this sin. He committed that son, sin. Counselor is saying that he steps in and says, hey, he's covered by my blood. You can bring no accusation against him. Hallelujah. He's my defense attorney. When hell wants to count me out, when the world wants to talk about my sin, I'm going to tell you, Jesus steps forward and says, I've already paid the price. I've redeemed him. I've, come on, what is God saying? Through the mouth of Isaiah, he is describing everything that Jesus needed to be for us. He's my counselor. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Can you imagine? The enemy going before the throne and telling God, Kenny, Brother Kenny sins. I can say that because all of a sudden it comes short of the Lord. In God, you know what? We don't understand. It used to be an old song I remember years ago in the early days of my salvation. They talked about forgiving. But it said Jesus doesn't forgive like men do. For Jesus forgives and forgets. You know what our defense attorney does? He steps into the hall of judgment. It isn't that we're just forgiven and our sins removed. You've got to understand the power. In the eyes of God, we didn't do it. Can you prove it? Yeah, he'll cast my sin in the sea of forgetfulness. Come on, somebody, I'm telling you what, I think I need to go down and shake some people. Wake up! 
He casts our sin in the sea of forgetfulness. What does that mean? That remember, I remember things that I did wrong. But you go to God and you say, hey, I'm talking about repentant sin. You go to God and you say, God, well, what about it? And God says, you know what, I don't remember that. Do you understand what I'm saying? Amen. The adulterer doesn't feel any hope. The murderer thinks it's too late. But I don't care how drastic the sin. When it's cast in the sea of forgetfulness, it isn't just removed. God doesn't remember it. Oh, somebody needs to say thank you, Jesus. What a defense attorney. Then the terminology, the mighty God. A lot of people do not understand. You've got to, you know, search a little bit to understand what the Lord is saying. People think he's a mighty God. All oh, that means he plows the devil in the nose. That means he goes in full battle. A man that he whips the enemy. The mighty God in terminology deals with this. This is so powerful. It's saying the mighty God couldn't be defeated by death. The mighty God couldn't be held by the grave. The mighty God hell couldn't claim. Oh, that is powerful. He is the mighty God. He has defeated death, hell, and the grave. Why would the terminology be mighty God so powerful? Because every one of us faced death, hell, and the grave. It wasn't for the Lord. Amen. Hell's gates would swing open for you. But because he defeated it. Somebody say, he's the mighty God. Oh, come on. Somebody get with me and say, he's the mighty God. He's defeated death, hell, and the grave. You know, I was in Bob Evans. My daughter thinks that's the old people's restaurant. She used to say the same about Bill Maps. And the negative people talk so much like that, Bill Maps had to close. Amen. But I was in Bill Maps. I mean, Bob Evans got the wrong guy. And I saw a woman at the cashier, and her hair was so white. And I said to my wife, I said, you know what? She reminds me so much of your mother. I'm going to tell you something. I had a wonderful mother-in-law. I'm talking about a godly prayer warrior. You know, most people talk about their mother-in-laws in a negative way. Well, I'm telling you, I had a great mother-in-law. She was a beautiful woman in, a, in, a, in, her, in her age. She was a beautiful woman. But you know what? Death took her. And I've got news for you. With all my heart, I believe death will not hold her. I believe the grave will not keep her. I believe in the Redeemer that she put her faith and confidence in. He is the mighty God. Oh, somebody say hallelujah. Hallelujah! I got to hurry up. The everlasting Father. I know that you've heard some of this before, but the Lord said it needs to be repeated. There's people who haven't heard. Everlasting Father, you search that out. It's saying the provider. It is his responsibility to prepare a place for us. He is responsible. The Father is a provider. 
I believe with all my heart. I want you to hear me. Let the devil hear me too. Construction is going on in the glory world right now. A place is being prepared. Oh, hallelujah. Praise God. My, think about that. Hallelujah. And it goes further. You have to go back into the Hebrew culture. Amen. The father had a great responsibility. When a young couple, why don't you stand up? Okay. Where's JJ? He's in children's church. Well, I guess some kids never grow up. <laughs> you can tell them I said that. But I got news for you. When J.J. Uh, proposed, we all knew it was coming except her. Went to one of those, you know, escape rooms. I tried to figure that out. Why would he propose at an escape room? And I found a king to me. He was afraid she'd escape. <laughs> Hallelujah. But if you were a young Hebrew couple, you would go to the priest. And the priest would take a goblet of wine. And you each would take a drink from that chalice as a public display of engagement or a spousal. When you did that, you were just as good as Mary. If you were a spouse, to someone, you literally had to have, if you broke it off, you literally had to have a written law of divorcement. That's how serious God took it. Once that espousement took place, amen, the groom-to-be would have to go off. This was required. And prepare a wedding chamber or a place for his bride. Amen. I got so tickled at Jeffrey and Ashley, but I got so tickled at Jeffrey. He was biting the bullet to get me. The pastor and I wanted to say to him, you don't know what you're getting into. Just, no, I'm lying. <laughs> but the groom, would have to prepare a wedding chamber. And I said that about Jeffrey because if the groom got anxious and wanted to hurry up, throw the wedding chamber together so he could have his bride, it wouldn't work. Because according to Jewish custom, that chamber had to be approved by his father. He couldn't tell when it was ready. Who couldn't say, come on, baby, let's go? His father, his father had to put approval that it was sufficient and it was all right. Oh, somebody hear me. The father had a great part to play. Well, I've got news for you. You don't hear this talked about a lot, and I think it's a shame, but we're the bride of Christ. I said, we're the bride of Christ. We've already taken his name. We have drank from the chalice of wine. What do you mean? We're filled with the Holy Ghost. It's a new one. We're a spouse. Amen. We're a spouse. I said, we're a spouse. In heaven, there is construction going on right now. But one day, you know, I'm not trying to tear in, but I know that God is a spirit. Yes. The fleshly temple of Christ was man. Yes. Anybody agree? Yes. Not two gods, one God. Right. But the approval of the Father, the Spirit, has to be on the wedding chamber. He said, I go to prepare a place for you. The groom, Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. That where I am there, ye may be also. But I'm here to tell you, I believe with all my heart, the Spirit, the Father is about to say, it's complete. Go get your bride. The trumpet's going to sound. The dead and Christ are going to rise. 
that we that are alive and remain are going to be caught up to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Somebody say, He's an everlasting Father. I've got four minutes to do the Prince of Peace in an altar call. So if I go over and you gripe, you really need the altar call. Amen. The Prince of Peace. The provider of peace. Amen. When the Lord stood on the bow of the boat and said, Peace be still. He had the authority, the authority to do so. The elements had no choice. They had to conform. They had to obey. I feel this. And I don't want to hurt. Amen. But some of you are in storm. Some of you are in the midst of Toma. You're in the midst of battle. Some of you are in a place that I don't understand what I'm going through. Well, I got news for you. The Prince of Peace was here to speak peace for your soul. Amen. Oh, hallelujah. hallelujah. I never preach this message that I'm not reminded of Sister Kelly Turner. I've used this example many, many times. Matthew, well, she was here tonight. I think i you all tell him that he should have been here and the pastor couldn't pick on him because he wasn't here. Matthew was born. My wife noticed. She said to Sister Kelly, she said, you know, Kelly, he's breathing funny. Something doesn't look right. So Kelly took him. I'll never forget getting the phone call from Hurley that he was in desperate need of open heart surgery. He couldn't have been, I don't think he was even six months. But I'll never forget, Sister Kelly was greatly distressed, her baby. She stood the altar, held him and prayed. And the peace speaker spoke peace. I will never forget it. She had that baby in her arms and she danced all over. Some of the sisters went and they tried to take Matthew, the baby, from her. She would no way, shape, or form give him up. I don't know how long you look at Matthew today, what a miracle he is. He shouldn't be alive. She danced all over with that baby in her arms. This sister thought, well, you know what, I'll take the baby so she'll have more liberty. Huh? Huh? She wouldn't give him up. I don't know how long she danced before the Lord with that baby in her arms. It wasn't too long we were at Detroit Children's Hospital. Matthew was about to have his open heart. This was a tiny baby. Open heart surgery. Sister Kelly Stan was there. And I will never forget it as long as I live. They were nervous wrecks. You know, they weren't, they didn't serve the Lord. They were smoking and everything else. And they were making their way out to get out of the waiting room of the hospital to smoke another cigarette. And Sister Kelly was there. Brother Glenn, I'll never forget it. It was like she was on a picnic. She had all kinds of snacks. She was there. Well, I'll never forget it. It was like, Kelly, the baby's having an open heart. Yeah, but you don't know. The peace speaker already spoke peace. I'm telling you, you would have thought she, she was laughing and she was, oh. Sometimes you need a peace speaker. And I feel led to do this. I'm not going to embarrass anybody, but Lord, in your name, 
you've laid on my, my heart that there's someone here in the midst of their storm. In the name of Jesus, Lord, by the authority of your word, by faith, Amen. speak peace to them. Hallelujah. God, it doesn't matter how bad the storm, you're greater. Yes, amen. Do you know that sometimes the Lord stills the storm? Yes. But sometimes we have to go through the storm. Oh, yeah. But he'll give you peace. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus, Lord, accomplish it in the life of every saint of God. Minister to them. Speak to them. Lord, let them know you're in control. That you have borne our sin. You have borne our griefs. You are you were wounded for our transgression. Our hope is not in ourselves. Our hope is in you. I'm going to tell you. I'm going to speak to everybody here. You don't know him. You need to know him. You know, I evangelized almost 13 years. And suddenly I got a revelation on the scriptures that says the goodness of God leads men to repentance. And I started telling folks how wonderful it was to repent and to give the Lord forgive you. I started preaching. And when you get baptized in Jesus' name, you take his name. Amen. You operate under the authority of the name of Jesus. He puts his name on you. You see that lady there? I've been married to her soon be 43 years. But if she would have come down that aisle, and she was a beautiful bride, if she would have come down that aisle and said, I'll take the title of being your wife, but I won't take your name, and I said, see you later, babe. Because if you don't love me enough to take my name, then you don't love me enough. You say, why is that important? My wife had credit cards. One or two. And she was probably a miser. I had that. But you know, Brother Ray, I didn't worry. Because the name on those credit cards said Lois Faye Brown. When it came due, it was going to come due in her name. But when she took my name, her credit cards changed. Suddenly, Brown was gone and Stoner was there. But I would be responsible. Thank God she's a good steward. But I'm telling you, I would have done I couldn't pay. But when I took his name, When the bill came due, it came due in his name. Somebody lift your hand and stand your feet and say, Jesus paid it all. Jesus paid it all. You know what? If you read the book of Isaiah and see all that he prophesied, the Lord would be, you'd have to be a fool to go to heaven. Because he's made every provision. I'm preaching to you that are weary, battle weary. Preaching to you that are in situations that you don't understand. Please don't discount. <clears throat> he's everything you need him to be. As they sing, I want to ask you to be God, become honest with yourself. I'll admit to you, there's times I've discounted Calvary. Why? Because I allow the enemy to deal with me with guilt. But he that the Son sets free is free indeed. Amen. And I encourage you that I feel the Lord. But where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Amen. As they say, I want to open this altar to everyone. He's fulfilled every office. Through the mouth of Isaiah had proclaimed all that he would be for us. 
I feel like I want to pray and say thank you, Jesus. I want to say, God, forgive me. Because you're more than enough to save me. This altar is open for you, God.